Итак, насчет э, способов оплаты. Значит, это, это большая сложная история. Э, в Москве с ней есть много проблем. Да? То есть в Москве сейчас э, турникеты, и очень задерживается вся система из-за этого. И никто не понимает, откуда эти турникеты взялись. И, в общем-то, нет особого понимания, что с ними делать. Э, и вот как-то вот в Москве я не видел ни одного исследования, как именно, вот какие есть способы оплаты, э, сбора денег и как вообще с этим всем работать. Вот было бы интересно поговорить об этом и узнать, как и где это происходит в мире, какие um, системы. Well, fares in transit, and the, the amount that you charge and how you charge and mm -hmm. so on, are very complicated. It's a very complex question. You have a, You have one question, uh, how high is the fare? The second, what uh, type of fare? Is it uh, constant regardless of distance traveled or does it change with the distance of travel? And then collection of fares, physical collection of fares. And these are interdependent. Uh, depending on what, what fare you have, uh, dictates how you will collect it. So it's... it's uh, good to sometimes systematically look at the factors which influence all this. Uh, and as I mentioned, one is what are the objectives, what do we want to achieve with fares, and what, are, what is required, how it should be. Then how it should be physically collected, physical collection of fares. Then the structure of fares, is it flat or is it mm -hmm. graduated. And. Um, many details and many interactions between these. So let me discuss some of them. Um, when we try to solve the problem, we say, what is the goal that we want to achieve? Well, in setting fares on a train system, bus system, whatever it is, uh, every transit agency has or should have one of the main goals to, make, uh, to get the maximum number of riders. It is also pressed more and more that it should be economically sound, so that means that it should have the maximum revenue uh, from fares. And the third major objective is to achieve certain uh, social goals, that you have mobility in the city, that people uh, can get around to, to do jobs efficiently, uh, and to use transit more than to bring their cars. Even that is very important. In order to do that, we have to know the conditions and the type of transit system we have. One is the metro system, one is a tramway system, and one is a bus on the street, and so on. Uh, what is the... Uh, what are the conditions in that city? What kind of public it is? How many fares are uh, directly paid? How many are prepaid? How many are sponsored by the employer or by the government or by somebody else, what are the marketing aspects of fares, which are also very important, and what are social and political aspects. We also uh, know that fares should be easily understood by the public, they mm -hmm. are not too complicated, um, and that uh, fare collection Uh, should be uh, rather simple and reliable and uh, that not much cost is involved when we collect fares and especially the collection of fares does not call del call, cause delay of services because our main thing is really to provide good service to attract and to serve the city. So if we, because of some technicality in collecting fares, slow down the whole process. We may be losing more money than we are making. Mm -hmm. So um, let's start by defining the two basic types of fares. 
One is so-called flat fare, which is independent of the distance. Which is we have in Moscow. Which no. is what you have in Moscow Metro, uh, and in Paris Metro, mm -hmm. and uh, many other metros. Uh, and sometimes on tramway, the whole network is one fare, and so on. The other one is uh, graduated fare, which may be so-called sectional fare or zonal fare, but it really, the fare increases with the distance. Uh, that is uh, used uh, in some cities on most modes, in some cities only for those that go longer distance. But typically, for example, regional rail or some long bus lines, mm -hmm. They have to have graduated fares. In otherwise. Moscow, regional rail do have uh, fares. Okay. Yes, yes. Graduated fares. Yes, yes. Uh, I have some uh, suggestions that we should have even in this flat fare, in regional rail. But, uh, no, <laughs> you would not have a 50 kilometer ride for the same fare as for a 5 kilometer ride. We do have now in, in, in the regional rail inside Moscow flat fare, but if you go outside, you okay. have... Okay, okay. But you see, if you analyze all these goals and requirements of fares, you look at the flat fare versus graduated fare. Graduated fare results in more riders, more passengers, which is the main goal. Mm -hmm. It results in more revenue, which is also an important goal. So it is really... Uh, and socially more equitable, more efficient, and achieve these goals. Why do we use them flat fare? Because of some other requirements. One is that it's simple and understandable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's easy to collect and control. So this practicality dictates, but uh, you know, even New York, which is a very large city, mm -hmm. is totally flat fare, so you can go up to 50 kilometers the same as you go for one, one kilometer or two. Uh, London is uh, different. It's all in sectional graduated fares. Uh, I think that uh, New York could also use graduated fares and it would increase revenue and ridership. Mm -hmm. But there, there is tradition and political reasons we keep... Uh, now why is this happens as is both of them are increasing? Both of them are what? Uh, increasing the ridership and the revenues. How, how is this? Just more people use the system because of, if it's cheaper in some points? Or? Well, you see, you could, if you, would, if you would put cheap fare for short rides, you would increase riders. Because now, if you are in a city and the minimum fare is $2, you, you don't take mm -hmm. transit for half a kilometer or a kilometer. Mm -hmm. If it is 50 cents for a short distance, you would ride much more. So anybody who is riding fairly short distance would use much more. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, people traveling 10, 15 kilometers, they would many times pay a double what they're paying now. They would still use the transit because mm -hmm. it pays off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you end up getting attracting more people and multiplying those people by the fare they are paying, you get more okay. fares. Um, if you look in the, these two uh, things, very, it sounds very attractive to make a, a free transport system and just pay from the government to the companies that operate the buses or, or the trams. In, the, in Tallinn, for example, they made it now. Yes, in Tallinn they made it now, yes. Is it a good idea? No, generally not. In some exceptional cases, you have a small city and you have a big parking in some museum and uh, uh, you you or you you don't have enough parking I should say and uh, and it's very convenient for people to come and to hop on and hop off mm -hmm. the bus very conveniently that's fine but a real transit system um, it really if you want to to shift people from cars to transit there comes the idea well if we really want to attract them we make it free there are several reasons that that does not work. Uh, first of all, the most important one is that if you would make it free,
that means you would have to get the same number of millions of rubles of revenue from something else. Mm -hmm. Those rubles, in most cases, you could use better by increased frequency of service and more attractive vehicles and better stations and better information mm -hmm. than that. So, uh, in general, people thinking about the whole city and transportation policy, they are against very high fares or fares that would maximize the revenue. But they are against very low fares either because they say uh, very low fares are uh, bringing us less money than they could. Mm -hmm. And we could get more money and then use that money to improve the service and mm -hmm. therefore thereby attract more riders. Mm -hmm. I, also, mm -hmm. it's part of, finally, you know, if you are using transit, it's, it's only fair that you pay at least some, sh some uh, portion of, of that fare. And then the tests were made in several cities. And it was noted that even passenger behavior uh, becomes uh, somewhat less, uh, less proper if it's a free service. Mm -hmm. People come, some of them try to sleep on the bus, not move anywhere and so on. Uh, some feel that they can even do damage and so on. Attitude toward free service is uh, in, in many cases not as good. So that has been after these tests, mm -hmm. free fares okay. have been eliminated. And as a question, in Moscow we have uh, huge percentage, about 40% of riders are for free and these different categories of uh, people that have uh, subsidized from the government. Pensioners, students that have huge discounts, not for free, uh, other categories. Uh, is this a good idea to have a free ridership for, for example, pensioners or uh, should we just use this money to add it to their pensions and not to well there are it, it depends on the situation i cannot categorically say that okay. it's good or bad but there are many reasons to give either discounts or to or to fully subsidize those tickets and elderly and children and so on that's usually a social measure mm -hmm. we give to the elderly convenience or special facilities uh, for wheelchairs even for that's handicapped and so yeah. on and that you don't charge because that's a social measure why don't we why don't we uh, why do we give cheaper fares for children although they take space and so on because we in general in society we support families with children that's mm -hmm. a basic social attitude that's fine but, but uh, maybe we can use the money to just add it for example uh, if you take all the money that goes to subsidize to pay for these categories, um, it, it's, it's a little bit, if you, if you dispend all this money between all the pensioners, it's just a little bit less than the cost of yearly uh, ticket uh, for, for, for transit. So why, why just you don't, uh, you know, take this amount and just give them? And if they want to buy a ticket, they will buy a ticket. If, if they want to use it for something else, they can use it. Well, in, in many cases you have this, uh, you do want people to use transit rather than to bring their car. Yeah, that's And as right. people get older and older, mm -hmm. uh, in America there is such fascination of the cars that you, they're just analyzing how would people drive when they're 90 years old. That's <laughs> wrong. Mm -hmm. We should really attract them mm -hmm. to public mm -hmm. transport and to walking in the cities mm -hmm. for their own sake and for sake of others. Mm -hmm. okay. So there are good reasons. And, and then students, why do we give uh, student tickets? We give because that we also help students to study and to somehow uh, mm -hmm. survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the students tickets in Moscow for me it's fine because they are partly subsidized, not full. It's not free, but uh, the pensioner tickets are are fully subsidized, and it somehow sometimes bring uh, pensioners to go from one end of the city to another to bring something cheaper by yeah. one ruble. Yeah, uh, and that's I don't know. 
Well, that's what... And also their pension is very small. If you add this amount to their pension, it's, it's a big difference. It's like 10% or 5% increase. <laughs> and there's a lot of pensioners that don't use any transfers. I don't know. Well, you give one dimension to those people, more convenient. Yeah, and, sure. and mobility is one of these things. Only we, we try also through those subsidies to different modes to shift people from one mode to another. Mm -hmm. And as I could spend hours arguing, our main goal should be to attract more and more people from their private cars to public transport okay. and, mm -hmm. and walking and to make why do we why do we subsidize walking? We totally subsidize. All mm. all streets all are free walking. to walk on, right? Yeah. <laughs> Even bicycles are subsidized. But we, we consider that walking is the basic function. You cannot have a city where people cannot walk or have to pay to walk. Mm -hmm. So that's not a discussion at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, well, well, the that, goods are there is no discussion at all. But, uh, you know, it, it was no discussion, for example, nowhere about turnstiles inside buses. And yeah. suddenly in Moscow it happens and now it's there. And now it's stand on the table. Well, we can we can argue for or against some of yeah, this. Yeah, let's continue now, with the. Yeah. yeah, let's let's continue. The. Uh, so. We we have argued now that uh, flat fare has so many advantages that in a small or moderate sized city, it's very often the simplicity not only in collection but in control mm -hmm. of that uh, outweighs the negative sides as the city grows and as you are pressed more and more to increase the, the revenue you get in order to operate the system properly and if you have some uh, uh, some social reasons to, to charge more and so on then you go more and more toward graduated fares and uh, or some others. Some in some cities, we have transit fares. But when when the vehicles come into central city area, it's free inside that. Mm -hmm. So we discourage people from coming by car and trying to park and repark in that most dense zone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We we give them kind of magic carpet that once you're there, you're free to hop on any metro and any bus. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's that's how it goes. Um, the uh, so flat fare, we have to make a, a place where people pay, and where we check them to pay. With graduated fares, we cannot check only once; we have to check twice, mm -hmm. because we have to check how far uh -huh. uh, is the is the ride. Otherwise, everybody can pay the minimum and, mm -hmm. and ride the maximum. So, uh, what we do then uh, is that uh, we can have two types of systems. One is a so-called closed system, which means that the station is physically separated and people can enter only through some gates which record their coming. Mm -hmm. And they leave also through mm -hmm. check of that. Mm -hmm. So in that case, with those two uh, booths or, or, or turnstiles or whatever, barriers, uh, you have full control of entry and mm -hmm. exit and you check how much people paid. Now, that is not so easy to do on surface vehicles where we don't have enclosed stations. We have only the vehicle or train, light rail train comes and stops, but it's not physically fenced off. Mm -hmm. So in that case we can have uh, again several variations. Uh, one is that people simply pay a ticket and then from time to time there comes control and checks whether they paid it off or not. Mm -hmm. uh, then some 50 years ago we began in many cities to say, well, we will, we will not check you twice, we'll not check you even once, plus 
spot check. So spot check means sometimes you check. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course that spot check is uh, such that uh, people check, uh, the controllers check the passenger and if the passenger doesn't have the correct ticket, he pays a fine. Uh, then came that stage 50 years ago to say, well, if, if we are relying on this spot check, we don't have to have any gates. Mm -hmm. We have to have completely open system. So that open systems of so-called self-service, and we used to be called honor system, it's not honor, because we check them. Yeah. So we now call it better self-service rather than honor. Self-service is such that passenger pays the ticket either somewhere around the stations, right at the station from a machine, or from some other machine or office buys one ticket or 10 tickets or monthly ticket, uh -huh. or he can get it through the uh, uh, through the his salary, the payment in, in at work, or sometimes inside the vehicle they have they have this machine with tickets, for yes. example in Prague. Uh -huh. Yes, you can sometimes there are variations also. You can have a ticket usually stationary at a station, but then you sometimes have that ticket is valid for one hour or two hours, or you have a machine where you buy it but then you enter the vehicle and there you cancel it. So that ticket you can buy and carry it in two weeks and then go and then cancel it. So the ticket, you, you can have a ticket in the pocket and not worry every time. Mm -hmm. Each one has its advantages and disadvantages and so on. This has uh, been extremely successful and it is a uh, uh, system that works in many, many Central European countries uh, with great satisfaction, sometimes with adjustments. Some cities like Amsterdam at once started having a lot of cheating. Well, mm. then you either, in extreme, you have to reintroduce the conductor at least in some And there is in Trump, since Amsterdam, now conductors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is sitting in the middle of the tram with a kiosk. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, uh -huh. or you increase the fines, and the fines are then, uh, some people compute, does it pay off to get a fine every tenth time and then pay, and so on. So if the fine increases from 20 euros to 50 euros, 80 euros, then the, the mm -hmm. attitude begins to change. Uh, there is also uh -huh. something else that you can sometimes see that a person is caught without the fare, and he pays the fine and walks away, he's, he's embarrassed. It's not pleasant. Yes. Uh, I, I heard about uh, in France, about the community or something like this, that it was, they was against fares on transport. Yes. So they, they made the community that paying the fines. You, you yes. heard about this? Yes, yes. In some in France or Germany also. Those are some rebels. You know, you always have an extreme of people who would like to either check something or play with something or go mm -hmm. fanatically after one idea like against the uh, system and so on. You just, there is no rule and there is no simple solution but you just have to handle that if it happens. Sometimes you have to go legally and, uh, oh, that's, yeah. and say if there is such and such organization that's such and such penalty on top of their organization. You know? yeah. So uh, Okay. So interestingly, in some countries, people are still scared of self-service. People will cheat, mm -hmm. and they proclaim that their country, especially, people will cheat, but not in the others, which is nonsense, of course. It there is, is no exactly. country without cheating. <laughs> and there is no country with where you know thirty percent would cheat. No. Mm. Uh, in the United States, for thirty years, there was there were. Uh, attitudes, oh, our constitution, our basic country doesn't allow that you would ask anybody whether he has a ticket, which is absolute nonsense. Then we got light rail systems, where a, a car comes with four doors, or two or three cars, or four cars, so we have a train with 16 doors. Mm -hmm. 
which is absolutely impossible that we have control over boarding or boarding and the lighting. It's absolutely impossible. Unless you have an enclosed system, but you don't. Light rail goes... But it's possible to have a conductor inside. Well, but you, you would still have to have... A, it's still conductor is not a, a, an absolute... Uh, uh, foolproof. Mm -hmm. You know, a conductor is at one place and this vehicle is 40 meters long. In Russia, in many, the conductor go inside the vehicle. Yes, but does... Is that positive? Is that 100%? It's not 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that's not. Let's make so, a uh, vision of 100%, but it's not yes, true. Yes, 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 yes. So, there are variations, but in general, with light rail and with some articulated buses, it became obvious that uh, we, if we would have such a check on all passengers uh, at all doors or some of the doors, uh, the service would be slowed down so badly that it would be a huge damage. And this, let me just make a statement on that. There should be in every city some system of fare collection which has absolutely minimum impact on delays in service. Delays in service are very costly in all respects, not only in money. They're costly because for any one metro line or bus line or light rail line to offer the service every five minutes. Uh, you need many more vehicles if they're going slower so that it really costs you more to provide that service. Then passengers have a slower service which means they're losing their time and so on. And finally, if it's very slow service, which happens also, those people who are marginal, use the car or not, they'll go to the car. In and Moscow, then we'll have damage with the whole city and parking and requirements. And, and In Moscow, the patients is that have to pay for, because this 40% don't pay, but the 60% that pay or, or something, this is a percentage, uh, they go to Jitneys, to small buses or to taxis. Or, because it's in, in Russia, in Moscow, unregulated taxes, taxi, very cheap. Uh, or they sometimes walk, uh, which is good, but still. Uh, but the system loses the passengers that pay. Everybody that yes. go for free, they keep, because... Yes, not. yes, that's right, that's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just mention this. Uh, talking about fares and how high they should be, it is somewhat paradoxical that you in Soviet Union had very low fares, very un, totally uh, not based on any economics. It was well, no, they, they claimed that this, uh, the operational costs, mm -hmm. they charge only operational costs. Because of this, it was tram three kopeki. Uh, trolley was four and the bus five because the, <laughs> the tram is cheapest to operate and the trolley was next and the bus next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, it not looks like this really was connected. It's just yeah, but they were, they were generally extremely low fares. Yes, almost. And free. it was not discuss, discussed. Does that cover investment cost or not, and so on. Now you changed your economic system. And. Uh, you are going in some cities, I understand, in Irkutsk or somewhere, where there is deregulated public transport competing by many uh, uncontrolled owners, uh, sometimes low-quality buses, untrained drivers, I mean, real low quality. Mm -hmm. So you're going to the extreme right-wing solution, which says there should be free market and uh, transit should not be subsidized at all. Whoever understands urban transportation and impact of transportation on entire city and society and its economy will tell you clearly that there are many, many reasons why we have to contribute financial aid to public transport. And that is uh, 
not to go into long discussions, but first of all, because mobility is worth a lot, convenient mobility of population so that people can cheaply travel to work and from work and so on. This Historically, it was like that, that there was a lot of unemployment when uh, transportation was so expensive, people couldn't go four or five kilometers to their work. Uh, so basic mobility is worth a lot to individuals and to the society and to economic vitality. Mm -hmm. Second, if you want to provide mobility, it is much lower cost and environmentally and socially more efficient to have as many people as possible on public transport. And public transport means also you have more people walking in the streets and they make the city more lively. Mm -hmm. So that uh, we want to favor public transport in comparison to uh, private automobile. Private automobile, are we subsidizing it? It seems that, well, the driver pays, pays for gasoline, pays for car and so on, that's it. And sometimes. It's not that. Mm -hmm. It's not that. Driver, driving may be in the Ural pla uh, mountains at four in the morning doesn't impose any social cost on anybody. But as you come closer and closer to cities, and as you are in the peak hours, and if you are in congestion in, in, in Tverskaya or in, in uh, St. Mm -hmm. Petersburg or in Samara, mm -hmm. you are adding a lot of cost on everybody else who is traveling in that city and in degrading the entire city. And this can be counted on money if, if you make this uh, research. Can be counted on you, you can uh, show it with, with money. Yes. It, 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 can, yes. it can be translated to money. Yes, yes. It can be translated. And all studies mm -hmm. show that when you drive an automobile, what you are paying directly from, from your pocket, that means for gasoline or petrol, and for parking and so on, is usually uh, a small percentage. In the United States, it's about 15% of total cost of you owning a car, maintaining the car, driving, mm -hmm. and so on, uh, all these costs. So you're, you're really paying directly a small amount. You're ignoring the large amount which is not directly paid, but you're still paying it. And you're also not only ignoring, but most people are not aware of the social costs which are imposed on everybody else by increasing uh, volume of traffic, by creating propka, by bringing uh, unsafety and accidents, by deterioration of the city, by making uh, sidewalks unattractive and the entire city becomes less and less attractive and that can be shown by pictures and pictures of cities which tried to mm -hmm. adjust the city to the automobile An interesting and uh -huh. failed and those cities that invested most into building super highways or freeways through the cities they now after 40-50 years have much worse traffic congestion than cities which did not build that many highways but approached by solving uh, through different mode of modes of transportation. The interesting thing with this is just that uh, no, almost nobody in Russia, even in um, high position in uh, municipalities, and uh, they, they don't understand that there is a connection between what you said now and economical things. They don't see any co any connection. They don't see any economic effect of good transport to the city. They think that, yeah, well, convenience, well, it's, they, they um, um, assume that it's only social thing, that we, we should contribute, yeah, we should do good transport, yeah, because people want to go in good transport. But they don't understand that it has any economic effects that is rather amazing that people don't understand that because the whole history showed how cities grew 
uh, with great influence of transportation, great influence of transportation, and the influence of transportation, just to shorten the very long story about that, uh, transportation was needed to bring supplies to cities mm -hmm. and without motorized vehicles that was very limited so there was a horrendous congestion in cities everybody had to live up to three four kilometers from work that was the era when huge slums were developed in London and New York and, and, and mm -hmm. Berlin and so on all these old cities very bad conditions very clearly, when we invented public transport first and different modes, first electric tramways was mm -hmm. the first, and then the metro, and then later came a bus and other modes, how the cities were opened up and be people began to live farther out and, uh, and to have a higher quality of life and to have better chance to find work and to get to... People were coming into cities not only to find jobs, but also to have medical services, cultural things, schools, uh, museums, everything else, mm -hmm. or conveniences. That was all because of accessibility. Because mm -hmm. in villages you just don't have that. But in the city, if you have a congested city, that city does not function as well as a, as a well-planned city for obvious reasons. And now, uh, if you are thinking, should you have your convention with 500 people or 5,000 people? Should we go to New York or should we go to Paris? Should we go to Moscow? Where should we go? One of the important considerations is, oh, that city is so nice, you can walk around and mm -hmm. you can walk to historic things and you don't have to depend on the car and you can hop on the metro in Paris and push a button, it shows you where you go and you're there. It's a city with so-called ubiquitous mobility. It's totally different one than those that are confusing, congested and, and unpleasant. Mm -hmm. So to not to consider mobility and transportation and what kind of transportation you have, what modes of transportation you have, uh, because transportation also is parking. You, you want some reasonable parking, but you don't want excessive parking because it damages the city. Uh, you want to include the pedestrian areas. You want to walk you know, pleasantly. And Public transport is absolutely a must, efficient public transport, and not, not only during business hours and stopping at 8 or 10 in the evening, but really <laughs> going at least until midnight. That is one of the reasons we had in San Francisco recently. They said many people would go in San Francisco but would like to stay over midnight, and, and the metro is stopping at midnight. The extended metro, first in, on Fridays to 2 o'clock, and now and every night and so on, it changed the life in the city. It changed the image of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And not to understand that is uh, surprising. <laughs> it's surprising, yes. Well, yeah. Uh, okay.